Well, we're going to have a great time today because we get to play with these little blue guys and I get to draw and play with my iPhone. <laughs> so this is, this is going to be my second talk in a string of short talks on the power of telling the stories of Scripture, or maybe you could t just call them Yeshua's stories because they all are his stories. They're all about him, ultimately. Uh, word of mouth. And uh, maybe we could do a quick review because we've, I took a little hiatus for the last couple of weeks. We had Dave and Leighton here sharing last week about their journey from kind of traditional church pastors to doing the, the simpler house church thing. And then the week before that, we were at a talk coup. So do, you, do, you, do any of you guys remember what we covered the Shabbat before that? <laughs> Some of you weren't here. So I, I could just give you a quick recap if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Basically, I, I told the two stories of how the Torah was originally communicated and how the Gospel was originally communicated. Uh, the Torah, of course, like you mentioned, Shoshana began with Adam and Eve. And I, I, I nicknamed them by their English equivalents. We called them Red and Viv and the tribe that they started and the power that that tribe had because every seventh day they stopped working and they spent time together as families and as a tribe. And what did they do? They talked a lot and they told the stories about their history, where they came from, why there are weeds in the fields, um, all of these things, right? And then we also talked about how Yeshua started a movement. He gathered a circle of men and women around himself and he, he, gave, them a, he gave them teachings. And, uh, and then he imparted his spirit to them and he sent them out into the nations basically to, to flip the world for good, for the kingdom of Elohim. And... Um, for a couple decades, they didn't write anything down. Just like the Torah wasn't written down for, for centuries, literally centuries and centuries, until Moshe came and wrote it all down. It was just told word of mouth over generations. Um, same thing with the gospel originally. For a couple decades, they just, uh, in good Jewish fashion, they just memorized the master's words and then they, they repeated them over and over and over again and they imprinted them on new generations of disciples and they told the stories about what Yeshua did and how he was born and how he was crucified and raised from the dead. All of the stories, eh? So that's, that's remarkable though because when you look at your scriptures, the, the first, what is that, about the first fifth of the book, you know, um, well, I guess that wasn't all communicated orally originally, but much of that was. And then it was written down. And when you look at the Gospels, those were originally communicated orally for decades, word of mouth, and then they were written down. I like the word, when, when I think of orally, I usually think of like, like dental hygiene, like those little, um, those little toothpick things that you use with floss on them or brushing your teeth. So, you know, I, I, I often use the word word of mouth instead of oral because I think it's a word that is more meaningful in our culture, right? So when I use the term word of mouth and when I use the terms oral, they're basically the, the same idea, right? So we're just going to continue on that note. Um, this week and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at three problems. Um, we talked last Shabbat about how Yeshua, like he had such a heartbeat to go after those people that had strayed from their creator, that had wandered away, uh, people who were lost. You know, he said, these are the people that I came to seek. These are the people that I came to save. I came to, I came to heal the sick people in society. And, and then he gave us that same mission. And that's, that's always a question, right? How do we reach out to those people who are so far from the Creator? How do we engage those people who are, like, really lost? The people who are sick in our culture, how, how can we tell them the story of the guy who can heal them? And uh, when I look at the way, uh, the way sometimes that, that's done, um, both in the, in the Christian and the Messianic Jewish world, I think there's some areas where we could be more effective in reaching some of those people that Yeshua wants to reach. So that's, that's going to be uh, what, what this is about. Uh, today specifically, I'm going to give you some really interesting facts and statistics about uh, non-literacy rates here in North America and around the world. And I'm going to tell you a story a true story about a stone cutter, like a really manly man kind of guy, stone cutter named Scott, and uh, how he became a disciple of Yeshua. I, 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 think, uh, I think you're going to enjoy this. I know I'm going to enjoy talking about this. Here is an interesting fact. Here I have 10 little people, guys and gals, 
and they can represent everybody here in Prince Albert, our city. They can represent everybody in Canada or North America in general or around the world. So here's our little people that represents this. Now, I'm going to give you a fact and then I'll share with you a couple of studies that this fact comes from. Uh, here's a fact. Half of the people in North America don't read. Doesn't mean they can't read. Doesn't mean they don't read anything. We'll get into that. But half of the people in North America in general don't read. And two-thirds of the people in the world don't read. Again, it's not that they are illiterate, that they can't read, but they don't read books. All right, so when we talk about literacy, we're talking about reading books, essentially. Eh? That's one way of communicating. Is reading the only way of communicating? No, of course not. Eh? I mean, um, for, for what? Before Gutenberg came along and revolutionized the world, in the Western world especially, uh, how were things communicated? Uh, primarily, they were communicated word of mouth, orally. Right? Uh, today, uh, people, yes, they often communicate and learn from books, you could say by literate means, but there are also a lot of people today who continue to learn primarily through, um, through um, like visual and audio uh, learning, you know, through conversations, whether it be one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting, or um, let's say by flicking on the news or listening to the radio, uh, these kinds of things. Eh? So when I say literate, I'm talking about people who read books and learn via that channel. And then when I say like non-literate, that doesn't mean illiterate. Non-literate means people who primarily don't read, who communicate and learn via other, other means. Eh? So um, here's a, here are some interesting statistics from a study that the U.S. Department of Education did in 2003. Uh, they divided the populace in the states, and I think we could roughly probably say North America into general, into um, several categories. There's below basic in terms of literacy level. There's basic. There's uh, intermediate. And then there's advanced. Right? So they kind of divided everybody into one of these four categories. And this, is, this will be true of anyone you see on the street, um, anyone in your neighborhood. Um, everyone will fall into one of these categories, below basic, basic, intermediate, or advanced. And here's what they learned. Um, roughly half of North Americans are at a below basic or basic literacy level. So what that means is, um, like specifically, 14% of North Americans are below basic, and 36% are basic. So I'll, I'll try and write this down here. 14% um, are below basic. I'm left-handed, so I don't know if this is going to work. Below basic. And then 36% are basic. So what that means is out of these 10 people in Prince Albert, this many of them are basic or below basic on a literate, literate level. Uh, what that means is these are the kinds of people who, they can sign their name, uh, they can find how much medicine they should take on the medicine bottle, um, they can look at ticket prices, uh, they can read a pamphlet, like they're functionally literate, but like they, they don't use it, right? So that's, that's here in Prince Albert. That's basically anywhere you go in North America. And you know, maybe you would say, no, that can't be true of the people in my neighborhood. And maybe it isn't true of the people in your neighborhood. But when you smunch all the neighborhoods in a city together, maybe neighborhoods with a lower literacy level and neighborhoods with a higher one, then that's kind of what you get, hey? 37% um, of the North American population have an intermediate uh, literacy level. That means like they, they read novels and, and that kind of material for, for, for leisure. Uh, they'll scan the internet for information, maybe go check Wikipedia for two minutes if they really need to know something. Um, they'll connect through social media and uh, they, they can read maps and charts when they need to, those kinds of things. So 37%, that's roughly we could say a little more than three of these guys. So you could say that these are like our intermediate uh, people on a literary level. And then 13%, which is a little over two of these guys, 
are actually on a like advanced literary level. Uh, these are the kind of people that find, maintain, and use information from continuous paragraphs. So if you're the kind of person who looks at a book and you read the whole paragraph and you, and you aggregate your information from that, you are in this group on, on an advanced literary level. Um, here's something surprising. Only one out of every three college graduates are in this level. So two out of every three college graduates are somewhere in this literary level and they squeak through, right? Um, we probably have a higher like advanced literary level in communities like this because we were into the word. We study the word a lot and people who maybe aren't into the word or don't study the word a lot, they probably just aren't attracted or they check it out and they just you know, maybe even have negative experiences sometimes. Who knows? But anyway, that's probably, so this is, this is like your, your rough um, representation of a North American society. So I'll just, I'll finish writing these here. So you have 14% below basic, 36% basic, 37% intermediate. Intermediate. And then 13% advanced. Gotta love my writing, hey? It's kind of hard. I'm like kind of hunching like this, but anyway. Um, so here's the, here's the challenge with that. We have the word here, and it's the word that we're called to study, it's the word that we're called to live by, it's the word that if people hear it and they believe it, it changes them from the inside out. It actually regenerates culture. It, it saves people, it saves families, it saves cities. And we have this, and guess how many of these people are just going to go out and get a copy and read it? Like maybe these ones, maybe, except that they're usually the more educated ones, and guess what happens? You usually, when you go through university, you get a certain slant, you hear a certain slant about the Bible. You hear a certain slant about Jesus and faith in God and those kinds of things, right? So th that's a challenge. Now, that's just reaching people who, who let's say, don't have, who aren't people of faith. What about people who are people of faith, people who believe in Yeshua? You know, for, for I think, often the way we've done things in the church and in, uh, you know, in, in, um, in, the, in the Messianic world is we disciple people by saying, well, here's the book, so go home and read the book every day. And uh, we'll see you once a week, maybe. Something like that, eh? But guess what? Um, for a lot of these people, that's going to require a massive overhaul in how they operate. And, you know, people can do it. People can change. People need to change. But for a lot of people, that's just not the way they're, they're going to learn best. So it might not be the best way to disciple a lot of people. Uh, that's, that's something that we can gather from, from these statistics from this 2003 uh, um, study. Okay, I'll... Uh, give you another couple of stats here. Uh, this is from a survey that was released in 2004 by the National Endowment for the Arts. It's entitled Reading at Risk, a Survey of Literary Reading in America. And uh, now we're going to have a look just at North American males for a minute. So let's say that um, all of these people over here are not relevant to this conversation. And these three guys here represent all the males in North America. Now, do you remember how many people in North America are, are non-literate, they don't read? R roughly half. Half of them are below basic or basic and they don't read. Right? When it comes to males, two out of every three, or about two-thirds, don't read books. So, if you're talking males, you even have a higher non-literacy level. I don't know if that's a surprise or not. Probably, what are they out doing? Playing sports or something, maybe, hey? Never mind reading books when you can play sports. <laughs> but that's, that's, um, that's one of the statistics that came out in this survey. Um, here's something else interesting. Every year in North America, one million people basically stop reading. One million people in North America every year basically stop reading. 
There's like, there's, there's a trend away from literacy. There's a trend away from reading books as a primary way of learning or uh, gathering our information or, uh, or developing worldview. Where is that trend heading towards? That's kind of interesting. You know, if there's a trend away from reading books, it's interesting to also ask, what is there, where, what is there a trend towards? Um, that's more of a corollary question. But here's something interesting also about that. In this migration away from reading books, the age category of 18 to 24 years old is 55% higher than everybody else. So if you're dealing with kids that are just graduating from high school until about their mid-20s, 55% higher are just not reading any books. And not surprisingly, that's the age group that is also least likely to go to church or synagogue. Surprise! <laughs> but I just, I wonder if there's a bit of a correlation there sometimes. So, basically what that means is like less than half of North Americans read literature like the Bible. Um, here's, some, here's another interesting fact about that. Um, you know, when you look at, when you look at the scriptures, um, this book is 75% continuous prose. So most of it isn't poetic or those kinds of material, right? It's mostly narrative. And less than half of North Americans can handle continue, um, continuous pro prose. Okay, going to give you one more little set of statistics here. Um, this is from Dan Pointer. Uh, he's an expert in the area of book selling in the publishing industry. And he released a study in 2008 just called Book Industry Statistics from Dan Pointer. And he said that 80% of Americans, North Americans, did not buy a book last year. So when you look at, let's say, these five people represent North Americans. This one bought a book. And the rest didn't buy a book last year. His study also revealed that the average reader makes it, guess how many pages into a book before they stop? 18. 18 pages. The average reader makes it to page 18. So you get that? According to this study, in the, in the publishing industry, out of these, all these people that represent everyone in North America, this person bought a book, and they probably made it to page 18. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point, hey? <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, let's talk global statistics for a moment here, too. I had mentioned that in North America, about half of the people in North America are functionally non-literate, like they don't read. Um, globally, it's a higher rate. There are about two-thirds of the people, or people in this world don't read. And again, that doesn't mean they can't read. It means they just don't, hey? So, let's say that we have... This is the global population. This many people read books. And all of these people over here probably don't read books, including the scriptures. So that's, that's a little snapshot just of the world population right there. Now, that is uh, kind of challenging, actually, for Bible translators. I'll give you some interesting facts about Bible translations, just so we can kind of kind of think about these things on a big level. Um, there are roughly 6,900 languages in the world. So, 6,900 languages. Out of those languages, 451 have a complete Bible translation. So they have, you can see the Old Testament, New Testament, they have the Tanakh, the Tanakh and Apostles. That's how many have the whole Bible. Maybe we could draw a Bible with both, both sides open like that. Right? 451 out of 6,900 languages. 1,185 have a New Testament or the Apostolic Scriptures. So 1,185 have, um, we'll just draw half of it like that. Out of 6,900. And then, guess how many languages have no translation of the scriptures yet? 2,252. None. Language. Now, you just kind of think about that. Like, it's been almost 2,000 years since the man, Yeshua, said, go to all the nations and tell them about me, essentially, eh? Make disciples. And I mean, hey, it's, I think it's incredible that we have this many languages that the scriptures are translated in. But here's the, here's the kicker. In these language groupings, 
that have the scriptures, guess how many of them, how many people will actually read them in book form? These three. That means even in these languages that have the scriptures, these people probably won't read the scriptures in book form. That's, that's um, a problem, actually. It means there are a lot of people that are missing the word. <laughs> Putting the Gideons out of a job. Now, I, I, I do want to say, like, I'm a big believer in literacy. Uh, you know, it's, it says in the Word, like, study the Word. Read the Word. It's actually a command from Elohim. So people who aren't into that, I think, to some degree, it's just they encounter this call to change their habits in that area and get in the Word, eh? But there's also this question of how can we engage those people, whether they be here in Prince Albert or whether they be on a global level. How can we engage all the people that aren't going to read this with the story of Yeshua, with the truths um, from the Scriptures? And for those who come into our midst that Yeshua calls us to disciple, how are we going to disciple them? Are we going to give them a book and say, go home and read this book? And they'll be like, oh no. <laughs> or could there be other ways that we can disciple people? Eh? I, I, I think it's just one of these big questions that we can be asking and that we can hold in, my, in our minds as we continue to grow as a community, as we continue to reach out to friends and neighbors and, and co-workers and that kind of thing. Just remember, about half of the people that you know, the best way to engage them isn't going to be through getting them to read a book. So... That's something, that's something to think about. Um, I would, maybe I'll, I'll read you a story and then maybe we can just brainstorm a little bit about how we can best reach some of those people that fall into those categories of non-literate types. Uh, this is a story about uh, Scott the Stonemason. It's a, it's a true story. And um, it's from a book called Truth That Sticks, How to Communicate Velcro Truth in a Teflon World. It's by a man named Avery uh, T. Willis Jr., co-authored by Mark Snowden. He's like a really big guy in the Southern Baptist Convention in like the International Missions Board. And he's done a lot of work like wrestling with these questions. How do we reach these people that are not literate? And uh, I'll, I'll read you a story from here. Let's see. Um, his, uh, his ministry here is called uh, Real Life Ministries, just so you get the context. He says, It isn't just Christian leaders who are spontaneously telling stories about Jesus. So one of, this, one of these guys' solutions here is let's learn to tell the stories of Scripture, word of mouth, the way the Torah was originally told, the way the Gospel was originally told, so that we can reach all of these non-literate people. This is their basic idea, hey? So he says, it isn't just Christian leaders who are spontaneously telling stories about Jesus. When the Real Life ministry staff was experimenting with storying to see if it would work in their church, one of the community pastors was leading a group that grew to about 30 new people. Jeff, one of the group leaders, had tried without success to get one of his fellow employees to come to church. But when Jeff invited Scott to the home group, he decided to attend. Scott is a stonemason and has the physique to go with it. He's six feet two and weighs about 250 pounds. That first night, however, he was fidgety. The leader said, Scott, you seem to be nervous. Yes, answered Scott hoarsely. I've never been to a home group before, and you're a minister. Don't let that bother you, Scott, the leader replied with a smile. I'm just going to tell a story. He then told the story of Jesus getting into Peter's boat and inviting him to become a fisher of men. The group went through the process of dialoguing about the story, and at the end, the leader asked, who will tell this story next week when we begin our session? The people were new, so they all ducked their heads. Finally, Scott, who wasn't a believer, spoke up and said, I'll tell it. That week, he got his new Bible and practiced the story 40 or 50 times on the job while he built stone fences. One of his fellow workers came with him to the next session just to see what happened next. To everyone's delight, Scott did a first-rate job telling the story that night. But the clincher came the next week when Scott called the leader of the small group and said, well, I think I'm ready to become a fisher of men. He got what Jesus was saying better than most people when they come to Christ. So that's a story about a construction worker, Scott the stonemason, who is probably one of these, remember, we, remember, uh, remember that statistic? Two out of every three men in North America don't read books. He's probably one of these two guys. And... Uh, 
he probably would not have gone to church, but he had a buddy who invited him to a get-together at somebody's home, and they just told a story about Yeshua. And then they said, who's going to tell the story next week? Everybody ducked, and he was like, okay, fine, I'll tell the story. And what did he do? He got, he got the word, and he got into one story, and, and, and the father used that story about Yeshua to, to speak to his heart and to open his ears to hear the call of the master, hey? So, you know, so with, with these statistics and with some of the, the questions I'm raising, I'm definitely not bashing literacy. I'm not bashing studying the word, because I think we should, you know? I, I, but at the same time, I'm more raising the question, how can be, we be aware of these men who aren't going to read books, who don't communicate that way usually, and, and all of these people on a global level, hey? Um, one thing I think we're doing really well in the Messianic community is we get together as a group and we, re we read the word together. So we're not expecting someone to just go home and do it all on their own, because they probably won't. We're doing it as a group, and so you get that group momentum. And it's not like just reading, because someone's reading and everyone's listening, so it becomes an oral way of learning the word. And then we talk about it. You get that group dialogue going. That's a very powerful thing for a lot of people. That's where they learn best. And quite frankly, I think maybe that's why Midrash is so exciting. It has such sizzle to a lot of people. It's because so many people don't learn through that literary me those literary means. So many people learn through reading in a group context and, and midrashing over it, you know, having those discussions. So. Yeah, so those are, those are the basic facts uh, that I had here and some of the questions that they raised. I don't know, what, what do you guys think? What, what, what could we do with, with, with this? Uh, where, where could we take this possibly? Or like, how would the rubber meet the road? Let's say, and how we uh, relate to, I don't know, just like talk with people about Yeshua out there in the world or even how we do community, how we study sometimes, that kind of thing. Thank you for joining us in this message. I pray that it's been an inspiration to you and your discipleship to Yeshua the Messiah. Crown of Messiah is a relatively small congregation with a massive mission. We're not just making disciples and teaching the Word of God here in our city. We're also doing that internationally through vehicles such as the internet. It is our joy to offer you these messages for free at absolutely no charge. At the same time, we do have ongoing overhead expenses. It costs us something to produce these teachings and get them out to you. And we would appreciate it if you would, in turn, support our work in a practical way. Help us cover some of our basic expenses. You can do that by going to our website, crownofmessiah.com, and going to the donate page where you can make a one-time donation or you can set up a monthly automated donation. I'm reminded of the words of Yeshua's Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6. He said, Let the one who is taught the word share everything good with his teacher. So, if you're being taught the word by us, we would appreciate it if you would take the words of Yeshua's Apostle seriously and make some type of return for the blessing that we are giving you for free. That way, we'll all be in it together, and we will be a team accomplishing the mission that Yeshua has given us. And you will go from only being a receiver to also being a giver. If you're like most people, finances are tight. We understand that. Finances are tight for us too. That's why we need people like you to come alongside us and to back us in the work that Yeshua has called us to do. Thank you so much for making that donation at crownofmessiah.com and thank you for becoming a team member with us. We appreciate it.